What's up, everyone? This is Justin Bass with a brand new podcast of Through the Fryer. I am so excited to be back, and I'm even more pumped because I just finished watching the Michelle Obama Becoming Netflix documentary that follows her book tour about her book. It just dropped on Netflix today, and when I tell you it was the best start of my morning, like, I'm about to try and put this podcast into words because she not only goes through the book, but she really goes behind the scenes of her life. And I told myself, and I, you know, opened up my little notes. I was like, okay, write write this down. Write down some points that, you know, Michelle is going through. And I'm going to tell you, like, it was moments where I just started immediately tearing up because her story... You know, it, I mean, my story aligns somewhat with her. Like, you just see this journey, and I see myself in it. And it's crazy just to know where people start and where people are, you know, aiming to be in their lives. And I have to be honest that someone gifted me the book when it first came out, and I still have it. I still have it. And it's just really hard for me to read hard covers, you know, just to read a book. So I want to say in the past that I've really gotten to, into um, audiobooks. But, you know, I have this book and it was a gift from um, a close friend's mom. And she told me, when you read it, let me know how it is because, you know, I want to read it as well. And when I tell you, I'm definitely going to finish it now because is the documentary alone is just giving you a taste of what the book truly has to offer and i just thought it would be really cool just to go back and just tell you how this documentary just affected me right now in the moment while i can and while i have the time and while i still have this you know this juice this energy to just let out and positively vent about it so basically um if you haven't heard michelle obama came out with basically a memoir um and she wrote it two years after she left the white house she did this book and then she went on a 34 city book tour and basically just to discuss it and um you know it starts with her growing up in the west side of chicago I think Southside, oh my gosh, there's no way I can get that wrong. She grew up in Chicago, okay, see, I'm gonna shoot myself in the foot, <laughs> but, um, you know, she grew up, and, you know, how she, you know, strived to be, you know, this person, this excellent person in, like, academics, and her going to Princeton, and her going to Harvard, and her running into Barack Obama himself, and, you know, I really want to start off with how she talks about how she encountered Barack and she actually was his you know his mentor in school at Harvard you know to help him study and things like that and she remembers when she you know picked up the phone and his voice and how you know she felt this feeling and then when she met him you know like how she just knew this man was this man and then she talks about this tsunami and this is what got me she was like she knew what you know, the type of man that Barack Obama was. And she knew from that moment that she needed to be in a place where she was not going to get swept up by him and his dreams and his aspirations, but that she had to stand her ground and have her own. And it really just attests to how two people, two strong beings can come into each other's lives, but you still have to have a conversation with yourself, how you can't compromise who you are so you can continue to aspire who you want to be. And it's just, you know, I think about past relationships that I've been in with um, people, and I think about always wanting a partner, someone that's going to inspire me and push. And I've been so lucky that, you know, even relationships that have not lasted, that I've always been with someone that was really inspired by my passion for the arts and, but you know, were able to see me dance, that were able just to give in to my artistic side, even if it was new for them, and feed that. Like, I don't think I've ever been with somebody who's never had you know, an interest and open themselves up like that. So to see, you know, her path align with someone with this strong intensity for change and hope, I mean, it's just so inspiring. And it really, you know, make me think and, you know, not in what I'm looking for in a partner, but what a partner is looking for in me. You know, we always have this major checklist of dating and 
you know, what, you know, what this person has to have, what height they have to be, do they have a job, you know, and she also referenced the, you know, this quote of stats, you know, when you're going to school and, you know, how people are ranked in stats, you know, what's your GPA, what school did you go to, who did you train under, and it's the same thing in the dance world as well, you know, everyone was asking, did you go to the Grammy Intensive, have you been to New York, did you train at Ailey, did you go to the Ailey Summer Camp, did you go to Juilliard, And you think, you know, all these people with these stats, and I've met lots of people with these, with this amazing record on paper, and then you actually get to, you know, look, you know, beneath the layer, and you see that they're just like you, you know, like them making it into this place, or them making it, yes, that's great, that's awesome, but that doesn't lessen your journey because you didn't make it into that place. And I say that because I remember when I first started dancing and I would get the Juilliard application packet sent to my house and the Ailey one as well when I was um, when I was in high school and I wanted to take up dance. And, you know, my journey was a lot of me teaching myself in my living room, you know, off YouTube videos. A lot was me, you know, getting books and DVDs with ballet, you know, and then, you know, me getting on the bus to go see these studio classes, being the only guy there. And I was 16, 18, I think, you know, and I was I was in there and I was the oldest in those classes and I was just learning how to do a fuete about tendus and degages and I remember to this day how tense my body was not because I was just nervous what but because I was literally living in my passion and I wanted it so bad and I remember I never forget when that Juilliard packet came and I was looking at the time I was like oh my gosh what a dream because that's all I heard of you know all you hear are the big names Ailey, Juilliard, Fordham, you know, like you got to get into Fordham, you know, when you get into Ailey or you go to Juilliard and then you start to do your research and you see Juilliard is only taking 12 men and 12 women and they're the best of the best. And when I tell you, I was still thinking, I'm like, you know what? Like, okay, like I still might have a chance. And then, you know, reality started to sit in with me when I started to go on these auditions in my senior year of high school. My mom would drive me. You know, she drove me to Ohio University. She let me get on trains by myself to go to New Jersey to audition at Rutgers. You know, she was believing in me every single step of the way. And 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 honestly, it was just her blind faith in me. You know, I had very little ability, but I had a whole bunch of passion. And I convinced her, I was like, I want to do this I, and I, I want to do it. And I have to just say, like, having a parent, you know, that is so supportive and just of your dreams, you know, um, it, it, it shaped me. It's like why I'm where I'm at right now. And, you know, the journey is super humbling because I didn't get into any of those schools. I didn't get into any of those dance programs. And I ended up at Kent State for fashion design. And But I was still a dancer at heart. So when I had the chance to, you know, audition for the dance program, I actually did not get in. But, you know, they were like, well, take these studio classes, you know, at the university and audition again. So I was in those classes like crazy on top of me dipping into this fashion major and you know even then I still didn't have any sewing experience when I did the fashion major you know I got in basically because they lifted the whole um thing of like you don't have to submit these samples they were letting people in you know who wanted to learn and you think about how the academic process was and how it was so like scrutinized like you have to have a certain SAT you have to have a certain ACT you have to have this some type of internship. You have to have have a good recommendation letter. You know, you have to have been able to do some type of volunteer service. And I was coming from a high school that has so much talent. But because of where we were placed, because we came from East Cleveland, Ohio, you know, I didn't see a lot of people dreaming as big as I wanted to dream. So I knew that once I wanted to get out, that I was not going to be looking back. So once I got into school, you know, it really became a test of my faith um, and myself and really, you know, me wanting to just make it. And, you know, I, you know, fast forward, 
you know, a lot of things just cultivated in me just sticking it out. Like, I can't tell you how many times I called my mom, how many times I rallied around teachers, professors that saw something in me. And I can't tell you how angry I was at myself when I was not showing, you know, this A++ ability that I, that I know that I had in myself. But, you know, I was giving myself this um, expectation that was not going to come unless I gave myself the time to grow into it. And that's a lot, you know, that is a lot what stops people from dreaming and, you know, settling um, is because we see the potential in ourselves, but we, we don't know the access to get there. We get very stuck in our own way. And because we see these visions, we have these dreams, you know, we have people telling us that we could have been this or we can be this. We now start to add that to our checklist. And now if we don't check that off for ourselves, that we're not not only letting, you know, we're not only letting them down, we start to feel that we're letting ourselves down. And it's a trap. You know, it is an emotional trap and you have to be emotionally strong. And I really have to say that me growing up in the ghetto, in the hood, taught me a different layer of strength, a different type of survival technique that I would not have had access to if I didn't grow up that way. You know, like if I wasn't scared of getting jumped, beat up after school for being different, also for being gay and me figuring out my sexuality, if I didn't use my humor to navigate, you know, people who were trying to attack me and make me feel less than, I don't think I would be where I'm at. But all those skills came from my mother showing happiness. You know, she hid a lot from us when she was battling a lot. And I have to say, even the things I did see, it did shape me. But the things that it's probably things that she would never tell me because she did not want that to affect my vulnerability, my heart to open up because my mom is a very closed off person. You know, she's very sweet, super open and loving. But just, but there are parts of her that I know that she is that she has locked down with a key with everything. Um, and, you know, that's made me want to become more open up. But her strength is a part of me. So, you know, circling back to the Michelle Obama and the documentary, you know, what I just hinted on was just the power of a story and just knowing that everyone has one. You know, one of the parts of the documentary, you know, one of the students, they asked, you know, how do you not just become a number? And she's, you know, and, you know, Michelle Obama, she just says, invest in your story, basically. You know, like your power is in your story. You know, there's going to be a lot of people with 3P, you know, 3.0 GPAs, a lot of people that's read this book or did this internship. But your particular strength, you know, because there was also another student and she asked, she was like, why am I here? Why did I get chosen to be a part of this talk back with Michelle Obama of all people? And this girl goes into this story of how, you know, she goes, she, she goes to school, she shows up, do what she has to do, and then she works. And Michelle Obama says, you know, why do you work? She was like, because, you know, my dad, you know, he cannot work like he used to. So I work so I can bring food back, you know, for my three brothers. And she said, and you're still asking yourself why you're here. She was like, that in itself is why you belong here. And she goes into this very simple, you know, explanation of... We have simplified our struggles to everyday life. Think about that. If you had to work an extra job, if you had to take care of a family member, if you had to pick up and you've been doing it on routine, right? It becomes something that you have catered to your life. You start to think and start to figure out like, or, you know, just start to simplify for yourself. Like, well, this is in my normal cadence. This is in my rhythm. Of course I should be doing this. And it's so funny because I have this internal alarm clock where I wake up like every day at 6 a.m. or sometimes 5.30. And I remember having um, my past roommates, they were like, why do you wake up so early? Why are you up so early? And I always used to say, I'm like, well, because I used to wake up. My mom used to wake me up in the morning. She used to say, Justin, can you go fix the lunch from the leftovers? Can you put that into a bag for me? And then it was some days when my mother's car wasn't working and I, you know, and I used to walk her all the way to the bus stop under the bridge. And it was about, I want to say it had to be five, six a.m. And, you know, my brother and sister, they were all knocked out. My younger brother was younger. So he got it easy. My sister, she was living 
her own fantasy and I was just obsessed with my mother we just built this bond where she asked me to do something I was gonna do it even when I didn't want to do it I remember days saying no and feeling bad you know because I'm like you know somebody needs to walk with her and she would walk in the winter sometimes I would go with her to the bus stop and then I just kept waking up I never stopped waking up earlier from that moment and you know these are stories that we tell people simply but then we think about like damn like that was you know imagine walking your parent to this place you know so she can hustle and make it work I remember saying I wanted something and poof it was there and I remember the moments that it wasn't there and how I had to calm myself down off my high horse and be grateful that I had something I remember when I felt spoiled with nothing and when I didn't get something I remember the look on my mother's face it was like are you fucking kidding me You know, someone who was hustling for three kids. You know, none of our fathers were fully in our lives. And my mother was just a beast. She still is to this day. And, um, you know, that became a part of my story. Waking up, taking her to work. And the power and, you know, the effect of that is that now I'm a morning person. And I love it because I love being able to start my day in the morning. But, you know, you you think about the effect, you know, how you grew up. You know, I remember it was a moment where my mom, she was driving from work and I was coming from, I think, band practice. And I remember I had this heavy ass backpack from school because I used to get a whole bunch of books, a whole bunch of books from the library. I was obsessed because I was I had a safe place at the library. I knew the hair librarian. Shit, Mr. Chambers, we got along amazing. And he was this, he was the probably one of the first male figures in my life that saw something in me and just let me sit down and just read. You know, just let me. I was in the comics and every time something came in new, he 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 let me take it. You know, and just thinking about it now, like I don't know where he is now, but there's so many people that were that saw me and gave me something to hold on to hope. And I remember I was walking home, and I get home into the house, and my mother, she, the first thing she says, well, she, you know what, no, I was walking. And she stopped her car, and she was like, why are you walking with your head down? I was like, what? I'm like, am I, you know, my excuse, because I'm young. I was like, well, my backpack is so heavy, so, you know, my shoulders and everything. She was like, don't you ever walk with your head down. Don't do it. She was like, you walk tall, you walk proud. She was like, I don't care where you going. She was like, don't you walk with your head down. Like you like, like you ashamed of something. And I will never forget that moment a day in my life. I still remember the weight that was on my back, but still not using an excuse because that it was heavy. That meant that I had to wear my head down. She was like, you need to see where you going. You need to see what you, you need to be proud. You need to look up. And it's so crazy because when I was in marching band, we worked on so much posture. When I started taking dance and ballet, it was such a huge part. And people always used to compliment me on my posture. And it was the way she said it. And it was how she said it and how she, she was just like, there's no way a child of mine is going to walk around this world without being proud of whatever they're doing. i never forget that. You know, these are lessons that, you know, growing up that, I look back on because I have to be honest, I do have a really hard time, you know, looking at older pictures, you know, throwback Thursday. I hate it. You know, like I hate looking at old Facebook posts because it reminds me of this time when I felt like I was just so cavalier and just so I was free. But, you know, I don't I don't know what happened to that person. I think because I started to rein in and I reality checked in that if I wanted to get to where I wanted to be, that I needed to have a full tunnel vision of if of uh, of an escape plan. You know, I know when I was in high school and I started seeing everybody applying and going stuff, I was like, oh, I'm getting out. You know, like, excuse me, I'm like, I'm getting out and I'm not looking back. And in order for me to execute that, it's time for me to just suit it up. So when I was watching these different shows, looking at my scores and all this stuff like that, I remember I was like, this is a one-stop shop. Like, you have a chance to 
push forward. You know, you want to you want to always go to New York. You always wanted to travel. You wanted to go to these places. You wanted to see these shows. It's time to put it into gear. And the blinders were on. And I remember my mother, she telling me about my focus. She was just like, you know, you're going to make it. She used to say that to me almost, I want to say almost every day of my life until I left to go to college. She was like, you're going to be something. Simple as that. She was like, you're going to be something, Justin. And I was like, I'm like, yeah, I'm like, I know I want to. And not knowing what that meant and the power of those simple words and how we do not relate that to our loved ones is, is monumental. You know, reminding someone, even when they don't take it as serious, that you're going to be something, a simple phrase like that is life changing. You know, it can it it reworks and reminds the mind and the spirit that it has a purpose. And sometimes we forget our purpose when we're working an eight to five and we're providing for people because those are routines. Those are not purpose. You know, internal purpose comes from, you know, positive conflict that you want to be better than, you know, yesterday and of yourself. And then also realizing the fact of the power of time and process. So we go through these different layers and you have a parent that is telling you that this layer matters, that layer matters and continue to go on. And now you are reminded to affirm yourself of that because I'm going to be honest and even just admitting this now is crazy, but if my mom was to leave this world, knock on wood, I know that I would be okay because I literally have every single message she gave me instilled in my fiber. Like, my mother would live on fully inside of me, you know? And it's just crazy because, you know, it's sad to think about that day, but, you know, realistically, she has given me so many tools and so much advice, and we talk every day especially with this coronavirus thing going on and me being in New York, we talk every morning when I take my dog on a walk. And, you know, we just don't skip a beat. You know, we don't agree on everything, but she has come such a long way and I have as well. You know, it takes a lot for me to go back home and, you know, because I still have access to the home that I grew up in. But it's so much trauma in that house that every time I go back, it is an emotional journey for me. You know, to go back into this house that there was joy, but there was so much conflict with me trying to figure out my sexuality, me trying to figure out my blackness because I didn't feel black enough because I wasn't running with the thugs. I wasn't out late. I wasn't hooking up with girls like everyone else. Like I was I felt very self isolated. And my mom, knowing that I was afraid, you know, she put me in these extracurricular activities and she saw me isolating myself and she pushed me out. She signed me up for tennis, baseball, basketball. And when, you know, when marching band stuck, you know, she was there at the corner. Because every time we marched to the football game, we would always pass my street. So all my family, my aunts, they would be there cheering me on. And it was just, it was just one of those moments that now looking back that I've always had people having my back. And it's, it's crazy. It's crazy to not acknowledge that. And, in, and not acknowledge the, the 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 hope that people see in you because, you know, generations ago, they didn't have a chance to get out. They had to start from the bottom up. They had to get that first home. My grandmother, my grandfather, that home that my mom lives in now, that was something huge for them. You know, like that was huge. And now I, I know why my mom don't want to let it go. It's this big house that she's living in by herself. But, you know, it's every fight that they had to get to get into this. And then I was able to grow up in that. Now, hopefully I'll be able to bring my kids back to this house. And I will, you know, to show them where I grew up on Elwood, that I went to Shaw High School, that I went to Chambers Elementary because my elementary school was right next door to where I live. You know, that I was, you know, that this this place, that people see as just nothing has so much. East Cleveland, Ohio is so rich, you know? And the only thing that people know is the stat, is that it's one of the poorest, you know, cities in America. And it is on paper, but nobody is going beneath the paper because I came out of that. Nobody saw me coming. Nobody saw me coming. Nobody saw Charlene Ver Riley coming. Nobody saw Arthur Hill coming. Nobody saw... Erica Walker coming. Nobody saw all these people from my, Dominique Kaiser from my graduating class. Nobody saw these powerhouses 
coming and shaking the world and that's what we're doing you know and you know she talks about the power of the story and I think reminding myself of that path you know um it's crazy so then you know I think I probably hinted on this but you know she was just saying you know being visible for yourself you know was a moment that really struck with me in the documentary you know she was like she she never saw herself being invisible you know and she talks about and this is you know me going back you know she talks about how her family you know her mom her dad you know they made her be visible and that's exactly what I just harked on was just like my family being there for me you know my fellow band members being there for me my professors my teachers seeing me and then them giving me access to not only be seen but for me to act on it and you know and I think about you know how we take our turn you know, you know, we're waiting and we're waiting and we're waiting. And then once we get our turn, we kind of freeze up a little bit. Sometimes we don't act on it. Sometimes we step back. And I can't tell you how many times I got pushed to do it. And even now being an adult, how many times I have chosen not to. And, you know, those moments are monumental in your growth. Stepping up to the plate, literally. Taking a swing, even if you miss. You know, not being good at something, but having the courage to take a chance on yourself and I'm telling you I'm so grateful I'm so blessed that I've taken so many taken so many chances on myself but it's nothing without the people that have been seeing these things and it's just it's just so much to you know we have to just keep remember remembering to feed ourselves with these reminders that you did this you know you're there yes thank you for the support you have been amazing but there are nights that you're going to be with yourself. There are going to be mornings that you're going to wake up with yourself and you're not going to know where you are and where you're going. And you're going to have to accept the fact that this day and time still has purpose. You know, like you don't have anything on your schedule. You don't have anything on your itinerary. And now you feel lost, but you're not, you know, like you are still in this place where a lot of people don't have access to. And, um, you know, just remembering, you know, like the power of what people say and how you take that personally with you and you know she talks you know Michelle Obama talks about you know how she was in this limelight and you know people you know were obviously attacking her and her husband and her family being the first you know black people in the White House is huge but how she was personally attacked because of her looks and everything like that and she and she was like you know people would just brush it off to the side and they would say well you know it's just politics you know that's how and she was like no it's not it's, it's completely personal, you know, because you're attacking me and these things hurt. You know, these are real things. And I think, you know, when that moment hit and I wrote it down in my notes, because, you know, the power of words is crazy. Like, you know, I go back and I talked about how my mom, you know, gave me these words of encouragement. But then you think about the other side of that, the darker side of that, the reality of that, what you say has power and how sometimes you don't have control of that power and you're human, and your feelings are, is it, you know, it's another entity of you. You know, there's another being inside of you that, you know, that's working on emotion, that's working on reaction, and you have to tame that. You know, I can't tell you how many times when I was in college, I'm, actually, I'll tell you this one particular moment that was really, I'd never forget. I was taking my Pan-African Studies course, and, wait, I was taking that course, and uh, my professor, he was just, you know, you know, just talking about like, you know, the power of, you know, being black and then just how, you know, we're taking these steps. And then I also remember when I took my uh, English course in Miss Harrison, I'll never forget this woman. She was amazing. And I remember emailing her as I was getting ready to leave um, Kent when I before I transferred. And I remember it was this debate about, you know, like why black people feel like the world is against them and how we shouldn't be um, blaming white people and how, you know, racism still doesn't exist. I remember sitting in the back and I remember getting so heated because I know I, I said one answer back. I'm like, y'all not going to get it. You know, because I was going to a predominantly white college and all the colleges I went to. And I was always one of the few black kids in these classes and this English course particularly. 
And I remember that when I when I when this statement came up, oh, the fire inside of me because it was so many white kids. You just they were just questioning, like basically saying, you know, black people, black students are just taking this out of proportion. Like you're just being angry for nothing. And I remember saying, I'm like, well, you know, it ain't gonna be the same because at the end of the day, I have to make sure my shirt is buttoned all the way up, my glasses are on, everything look, you know, everything on me looks right because. I don't want to come off threatening even when I'm not trying to. So I can't walk around campus in my sleepwear or be comfortable or a hoodie and things like that because those things are being pegged against me. I look lazy, I look ghetto, I look hood, and I look like I don't have anything to offer. So I remember, you know, thinking about my outfit when I got into college. I remember thinking about how I have to blend in even though I stand out. That because I, I have to make sure these white people you know, think that they are safe around me so I don't come off threatening. And then I remember opening my mouth in that class and I was like, you know what, this is gonna probably seem like I'm attacking you, but I'm voicing my opinion. And I remember at the end of that class, I went up to the professor and I told her, I'm like, Miss Harrison, I am so angry. And she was like, why? You know, she, she she, she was like, why? And I told her, she was like, I know. She was like, but this is what you're gonna have to deal with. She was like, you're gonna have to find out how to deal with this anger inside of you. She was like, is this gonna stop you? She was like, it is going to, she was like, if you continue to let it, you know, be bigger, grow inside of you, she was like, it is going to stop you from going a lot of places. She was like, you're gonna have to deal with it. She was like, you're gonna have to find a way to voice your opinion. She was like, you're gonna have to find a way to voice your opinion to where everyone can listen to it because leading with anger is not gonna work. She was like, you're black and you're a male. She was like, you're gonna come off aggressive even when you, you're not aggressive. And I remember just thinking like, damn, that is so hard. I'm like, how do I navigate this? Like, you know, wh- how do I figure this out? And it really came from me just interacting with people more socially and also just being aware of what I was saying. And it was a, it was a huge lesson because I remember I have such a mixture of friends even now to this day. And, you know, not, you know, my arguments, you know, my fire inside of me was boiling up from years of me being feeling oppressed and feeling like my opinion didn't matter because I felt less than next to someone that was not as qualified as me, but because they were white and because, and and they didn't even do the most work than me, but because they came off softer and because they, you know, they came with these things, you know, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was a hard thing to wrap around because I was still a baby in college. You're still a kid, you know, like, yeah, you're an adult, but you're still a kid, you know? So that was a really hard moment. And it was a, it was a situation where I, and this is, this is going to be huge. I was in the dance program at Kent State and I remember I got into this piece and I did not think I was going to get in. This was in my early stages of dancing and this piece was hard. And I was telling the professor, I was like, this is difficult. I'm like, I feel very nervous about this. I do not feel ready. And you know, her response was, you can do this. You're going to do this. You got this. And I was like, I don't know. I'm like, this piece seems so advanced for me. And I was already in my head about it. And I was so nervous. I was so scared. And it was this one lift that was just not nailing. It was this knee lift where I had to throw it. The body was thrown on me and things like that. And I re- and I just remember just, you know, some of the dancers rallying behind me. But then I started to feel the weight of everyone being like, maybe he isn't this good. And I just felt the attacks. Like, I felt everyone getting frustrated with me. And yeah, I remember... It became a moment where we had the dress rehearsal, tech week, and we get on stage and the lift did not land. I was already nervous. And the girl who I did the lift with, she was just furious with me. Like she cursed me out, you know, like she came for me. And other people in the piece did too. And I remember this, I remember this white wave of people just coming for me and then during this moment the professor already invited someone who wasn't in a university and he was a black kid to come and do the piece and take my spot but she did not disclose to me that this guy was going to come and and perform the opening and close at night and I will only do this middle night and I was like well this is fucking crazy I'm like I'm like first of all you don't tell me you introduce this guy to be here to help me and then you tell me like the week of the show basically that this guy is going to be performing the major nights and I don't get any type of notice about this I'm like okay this is my first faculty piece but this is wild like this is crazy so 
I remember that I was livid, I was pissed, and, and when the the girl came after me, oh, I was over it. I was like, this, this piece is not that big to me. <laughs> it's not. And I remember quitting. I was like, you know what? I quit. Because when I start hearing people talking about me and being furious and shit, I'm like, okay, I'll do you one better. I just won't be in it. Because I'm not about to be here for you just to throw darts at. So I left. And that night, I got so many calls. The... The director called me of the dance program. She was like, Justin, we heard that you quit. And I was just like, yes, because this is awful and I feel and I do not like it. And then I remember everyone in the dance department, like, except, I want to say this, except for the, the people of color, the two black people that were in the department with me, they they were, you know, they were way much lighter. Like, they were not as aggressive. And I'm still friends with one of them today. But I just remember all his hate towards me. And it was awful. Like, it just, it was it was painful. And then I did not do that show. I didn't go back. But what I did do was show up back to class after the show. You know, the weekend show ended. And, oh, my gosh. It probably had to be the bravest thing I've ever done in my life. The fact that I showed up after I quit that show. Because everybody, when I, everybody was talking about me. Everyone, they were like, well, he ain't that good. I remember people just saying shit about me, grouping up. And I was like, damn, I'm like wow, this is, like, intense. Like, these people hate me. And then through that moment, I actually started, like, reaching out to other black people that was going to have my back, you know? And I just remember just feeling so attacked and being in a class, the professors were kind of okay. Like, they weren't crazy about it, obviously. But it was a huge moment that really taught me how to just push through adversity, but also me sticking to my guns and not letting me think that this one moment was going to define me because I quit this show. I quit this show because I was feeling attacked. I quit this show because, you know, I did not feel respected and I felt like I was being disrespected left and right. And it was just so much that happened. I'm like, I did not want to be a part of it. I couldn't be a part of it. And I'll never forget the way that, you know, I had a moment with one of my professors and it was going into the next semester. And she asked me, She, we had our one-on-one. And she was like, Justin, you just seem so bored. You don't seem like you're here. And I, my response, word for word, I was like, well, maybe what you're doing is just boring. Because we're doing the same thing from last semester. Child. <laughs> when I said that, that stopped everything. And she looked at me. She was shocked. She was shocked that I said that. And then the meeting ended right then and there and I left and I felt so bad because I acted on so much emotion because I was reeling from this performance that I didn't do this was a new semester for me I was working my way back you know I was trying to you know clean up that you know like yes I quit that show but that does not define me which was hard and I went after this professor and I told her this and I remember apologizing to her and I remember taking her class again with everything inside of me because not only that Not only did I prove to them what they thought of me, which was that I was this person who didn't deserve to be in the dance program, who had all this passion and ability, but was completely cocky. And I was just like, I'm like, no, this is me being confident. I'm like, I need this. Like, I started dance late, so like, I have to believe in myself. I'm not shooting anybody down, but look, I have to work this out. So I remember, you know, basically crawling back to that professor. I remember humbling myself. And, you know, the rest of that year really shaped a lot of me. And I remember going to, um, we used to have these things where all the professors would give you the end of the year critique about your semester. And I was so nervous that I like actually, <laughs> I remember having my iPhone and I had, I pressed the record, but I'm like, because if they come and attack me in this damn meeting, I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to be prepared to show the Dean. I'm going I'm to have proof that these people are coming after me. And I went into that meeting with my portfolio and it was, it was all good. I was shocked. They all talked about how I came back and they were all impressed at how I, you know, after that last fiasco with me quitting the show, how much I invested into coming back into the semester and how dedicated I was to, you know, showing them how that, that passionate guy that auditioned twice again to the dance program was still there and that I wasn't a hateful person. And that really changed a lot of me because at that moment, I didn't think that anybody believed in me that needed to believe in me for me to progress in this dance program. And I remember that I was already looking to transfer to a different um, school 
And I was like, you know, I told my professors, I'm like, you know, this is going to be my last semester here because I don't feel like um, that this program is going to be enough for me to make it where I want to be in the dance world. I didn't know what I wanted to be. I just knew that this program became very the same for me. And this had nothing to do with what I, you know, how I felt about me previously quitting that show or the attack on my peers. It really came from me knowing that this environment wasn't enough. And my gut was telling me, Justin, you gotta, you have, you have more skill now, so let's push it. So I went and auditioned for a few different schools, actually, and I was, I was on it, and I still did not get into those damn dance programs. I got into one. I got into Temple University, and I, and the director, he was just in love with me. It was this Asian guy. He was amazing. And I remember talking to him and talking, and I choreographed my solos, all of them. This was like in the height of me coming out of composition class and being completely inspired to make work. Because at that point, I'm like, I'm not able to do some of these ballet, petite, allegro steps right now, but I can give you some of my own flavor. So let me choreograph my own stuff. So every audition I went on, everyone always asked me who choreographed your solos. And I was like, I did. And they were astounded by that. And um, I ended up, you know, going back and everybody knew I was looking to transfer. And then I ended up doing the Garth Fagan intensive. I applied for it. And this is me not knowing anything outside of Ohio because, which is weird because I went to New York in high school, but I thought Rochester, New York was in New York City. So I'm like, oh my God, I got in and it offered me a full ride. I was like, oh my gosh, it was like three weeks. It was a long time. So I got in. And that changed my life. And then I ended up at Brockport. But I'll definitely do another podcast about like my journey through Garfagan and also my process through transferring to Sydney Brockport. But, you know, just to go ahead and just circle back on, you know, the becoming uh, Michelle Obama Netflix documentary that you have to see, you know, I think it's just really important to take a moment to reflect, you know, and, you know, reflection has this, you know, has this dual power. You know, you can either reflect for positive, you know, analysis or negative. And even those negative, you know, things that you see, you still have to find a perspective in them. Because, you know, as I look back and I talk about these stories of me working off emotion, you know, my emotion comes from an intense, intense pot of passion. And, you know, maintaining that entity and, you know, letting that reflect the best parts of me has really been, you know, why I am where I'm at now and where I'm striving to go next. So, you know, being visible for yourself, seeing a path in yourself, the power of your own story, staying grounded and giving yourself a chance to return home, even if you can't physically, but giving yourself that mental you know, travel back so you can see where you're going. And then just, you know, this uh, this tsunami effect of people in your life and how you can either get ready to stand up and be with that tsunami or get ready to be whisked away. You know, these are all, you know, life lessons and life journeys and attributes of yourself. But, you know, the main thing that I feel like I got from this Michelle Obama documentary is just the power of reflection and also just the power of just accountability for yourself but just knowing that you're human for that you know you you know you're going to get frustrated you're going to get you know angry your emotions are going to become overwhelming but you know this you know this intense passion for surviving is always there you know sometimes we don't think we're going to survive if we don't have our cell phones we don't have this close contact that we don't have this special food or this special so these really small things but then you start to remember like how you already survived without that when you were growing up, when your parents were working these jobs and you were just going to school, you know, and where you're at now and how you're surviving for yourself, especially during this moment of the coronavirus and people without jobs, which is huge. So you're surviving and you're thriving and you're also, you know, tapping into these surviving tips that you're that you saw from your mom and your dad and your grandmother and you picked up on these notes. And you put them in your tool belt without even knowing. So you are going to be okay, actually. You're going to make it. And the only thing that's going to stop you is you. So you have to, you know, become yourself and continue to feed yourself these positive affirmations and always find perspective, even in some of the darkest moments. Because there's growth in everything. You know, something can grow anywhere, but you have to, you have to be the person that's beaming that light onto it to give it that energy, that juice. So, 
I just took you down memory lane of Justin Bernard Joseph Bass. That's my government name, but don't try to run it for credit because you're not going to get anything. Um, <laughs> I just took you down memory lane of me and my process, and I can't wait to come back. And I'm so happy I was. I jumped right into this podcast right after watching this documentary because I was so inspired. And I hope that you enjoyed my story. I hope, you know, I hope you tune into your own story and I hope you share your story. I would love to hear it. Hashtag, what's your story? And this is a brand new podcast of Through the Friar. Follow Through the Friar on Podbean, iTunes. It's also on Google Play. Google Podcast or something like that. And um, yeah, just to subscribe and share. This is this is me in front of my small little microphone, just spreading love and joy in a story. So enjoy the rest of your week. And thank you so much for listening to Through the Friar.